Good morning, doctor. Today, the following patient is presented at your clinic. It's a seven-year-old female neutered Aradil Terrier with a history of seizures. She was investigated by a colleague two days ago for a stiff, stilted hind limb gait on walks and for general lethargy. Radiographs of the spine, pelvis, and proximal hind limbs were unremarkable, and blood sample was taken, but results are not available yet. Last night, three generalized tonic-clonic seizures were seen by the owner, each lasting around 60 seconds, and now this patient is presented to you. One of your colleagues hurries to obtain the blood sample results from the labs, and I'm going to show you the lab results right now. So let's go over today's patient's lab results. The hematology is essentially unremarkable with nothing really crazy going on. If we look at the biochemistry, there's a lot more going on here. Starting with chloride, we can see it's below the range, meaning our patient is hypochloremic, but it's not incredibly severe, so it's mild hypochloremia. We see a pretty severe hypocalcemia. And then we have a mildly raised inorganic phosphate, glucose, ALT, and AST, none of which are really extensive enough to cause clinical signs. And the same is the case for GGT with a very mild increase. The last thing we notice on our patients biochemistry is an increase in creatine kinase. An increase in creatine kinase tends to point to muscle damage, which is completely in line with the fact that our patient has a history of seizures. So this finding of a raised creatine kinase is not weird at all, and it's also not high enough for us to really think this could be the cause of whatever is going on with our patient. It is simply the consequence of the seizures. Now that we've taken a, a good overall look at the abnormalities in our blood sample, let's look quickly at some of the main differential diagnoses for seizures. So seizures can be grouped in different ways. Um, a primary seizure, this is the idiopathic one. We really don't know what's the cause here, and many of the cases uh, of seizures do fall into this category. Secondary seizures are caused by abnormalities inside the skull. So we can have a tumor growing there, we can have congenital or anatomical abnormalities, we could have inflammatory or infectious disease leading to swelling or edema inside the skull, and we can have vascular disorders which can also lead to swelling and edema inside the skull, which can cause seizures. Reactive seizures, on the other hand, are caused by metabolic or toxic causes. Um, if we look at this, of course, we can have toxin ingestion, but also hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hepatic encephalopathy, and polycythemia, which could all lead to seizures. When we look at our blood sample results, we want to pay specific attention to the following measurements in regards to diagnosing whether it might be a reactive seizure, and that's the blood glucose level, particularly if it's low, the calcium level, particularly if it's low, as well as the packed cell volume, the PCV, to see if there is polycythemia present. So let's look at the blood results again, and at these parameters in particular. We've already, we've already noticed that we have a pretty severe case of hypocalcemia, so this is starting to look pretty important for our seizure case. On the other hand, our glucose is actually mildly elevated, so we can confidently rule out glucose, specifically a low glucose, as a cause of this seizure. 
Having said that, let's take a closer look at what we've decided to be the most significant measurement in our lab results. Let's dive a little bit into hypocalcemia. First of all, we know that this can cause seizures. And it seems up till now the most likely cause of our seizure since we have ruled out any nervous signs or nervous deficits or things like that. It is also important to know that the calcium measurements are particularly prone to error. So whenever we have a low or high calcium measurement, always double check with another measurement to make sure that this wasn't an error. If we look at how calcium is actually measured, we will find that most labs will measure two portions of calcium. The first one being the total calcium. That's what our measurement is in this specific case. But often we also see ionized calcium. And let me just explain quickly to you why we measure ionized calcium as well. Uh, if we look at how calcium is moving in the body, we will find 45% in a bound state circulating, and we find 55% in a free ionized state, and this is the biologically available portion. So the total calcium measurement is going to be the two of these summed up, and the ionized calcium measurement should amount to about 55% of the whole. And if it is drastically lower than this, then it is really clear that we have a strong depletion of calcium. So looking back at what might cause a particular hypocalcemia, let's think about that a little bit. Um, if we have a non-whelping bitch, So not in lactation, which might cause hypocalcemia. And there is no suspicion of exposure to ethylene glycol, which also might cause hypoglycemia. Then the most common cause of hypocalcemia is primary hypo parathyroidism. How would we be able to diagnose or rule out primary hypoparathyroidism? So how can we diagnose primary hypoparathyroidism? To do this, we need to demonstrate an inappropriate level of parathyroid hormone. However, parathyroid hormone and calcium influence each other in a healthy animal. So to be able to diagnose this, we always need to measure them together at a time where we know calcium is abnormal. So we're going to take a new measurement of calcium and then as well uh, of parathyroid hormone and we are going to look at these results together. These two substances have the following relationship in the body. On the long axis, we have the calcium concentration, and on the y-axis, we have the PTH concentration. So here we are in the area of hypercalcemia, and here we are in the area of hypo calcemia and between them is the normal range. What you will notice is that in the healthy animal, in a state of hypocalcemia, parathyroid hormone will be elevated, while in a state of hypercalcemia, parathyroid hormone will be low. So this is why we need to measure them together. And we have done this in our patient. And our repeat assessment shows that our total calcium was 0 0.9 millimole per liter, so still drastically low. Our ionized calcium was 0 
millimole per liter. And we know by now that our PTH should be elevated because we have a clear case of hypocalcemia. However, PTH was below limit of detection. So low that it could not even be measured. So these values together confirm our diagnosis of primary hypoparathyroidism. Did you get that right? Please let me know if you did and look out for more cases like these to come in the future.